I think this is my third presentation here, so I'm not like the newbie. Uh, today's presentation is going to be about TypeScript, a little bit of fun with types. Uh, this is a not advanced, an advanced presentation, not advanced like TypeScript things, uh, mostly for, for, for people who are slightly familiar with TypeScript or even don't know anything about it. So it's just a beginner, beginner level. But anyway, I expect you to have some fun in, in it. So let's start. So I'm pretty sure that everyone has seen this error before in JavaScript when developing like front and the back end applications, so like cannot read something of undefined, undefined is not a type, something like that. So yeah, it happens a lot to all of us. So where's the fun in it really? Like there's no fun. Uh, let me tell you a story about it. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was on a project where we were developing a, a front-end application. That was, yeah, a long time ago, really. So TypeScript was on the market already, but still wasn't that popular. And one time we deployed the application and just shortly afterwards, the client calls us, hey, uh, I click a button and I get a blank screen. Like nothing happens. I mean. It's like oh, everything freezes and a blank screen appears. So it's really a problem, right? So we went to the console and saw that uh, something is not a like property fun to find, this kind of error, same one. And like, what the hell's going on? So went to the code and saw like a small typo, really, like something like letter A instead of letter B or something like that. So some really small scale bug. And then, well, we took about a minute to find it and another five seconds to fix it. So that was very easy. But then uh, we wanted to deploy the application. The client was waiting. Uh, so yeah, let's deploy it. And then, well, we run the deployment pipeline. The deployment pipeline takes about 20 minutes or even more. So we spent like one minute in finding and fixing the bug and then about 20 minutes in having the application deployed and, and ready. And the client was just on the phone like, hey guys, where is my application? It cannot work. It was really like angry after those 20 minutes of waiting time. So as you can see, like a small bug, like a typo can really ruin your day and have your client be angry at you. And you waste a lot of time. Like even if you fix it one minute, then it could take another 20 minutes, half an hour for the pipeline to have it deployed. So you waste, a lot of time for that and the pipelines are really long these days so how could we like solve it better i mean like the problem would not exist if it was typescript but it wasn't so that was our like lesson learned you should use better tooling for what you're doing so typescript is a would have been a, a great solution for that so what's typescript really it's a it's javascript with types and some other things as well, but mostly it's JavaScript with types, really. Um, so it's a strict superset of JavaScript. When you take a JavaScript file, which is a valid file, then it's also valid TypeScript. So you don't need to learn a new language. It's not like CoffeeScript or our like REST script or some other like JavaScript-like languages. No, it's just pure JavaScript with some types in addition. So you basically add uh, type annotations like this and you get TypeScript. As you can see here, there's some like, you define A and B as numbers and that, that, that turns JavaScript and TypeScript really on a small scale. So what exactly ja TypeScript has, it has strong typing versus weak typing of JavaScript. That means that the types are really there to be enforced by the compiler instead of being just like suggestions in JavaScript, JavaScript types really nothing really important and TypeScript is really a, a strong thing. Also static typing versus dynamic typing in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, when you have a variable or any property of an object or something, you can just reassign its type anytime you want. You can change it from a number to a string or to an, another object, an array, anytime you, you want to do it. But in TypeScript, you can't. When you define a type of something, the type sticks and you cannot change it in runtime, which is a good thing, really. You don't want to do that. So 
also the type system of TypeScript is an unsound one, contrary to a sound type system. What does it mean really? It's like you don't have like 100% code, like type coverage of your code, which means that some of the code will not have types. Uh, unlike in, let's say, Java or C sharp, when you have 100% like sound type system, which is slightly worse, I think, but it's uh, expected to be this way simply because JavaScript uh, is just too dynamic of a language to be able to uh, have a sound type system. It's just impossible, I would say. And also, there's one thing connected to this less than 100% of code, like type coverage. It means that it's TypeScript supports gradual typing, which means that you can put types to a part of your code instead of all of once, which is very good for migration. If you have JavaScript code base, you want to apply typing. If it was a total typing, like a sound type system, you would need to cover all of your program at once with types, which is a very hard job to do if you don't have the types from the beginning. And in TypeScript, it's not necessary. You just apply types gradually, function by function, module by module. So it's much easier to migrate your code to TypeScript. Also, it has local type inference. What is? Well, it's not a global inference and also no inference. It means that the compiler can infer or guess the types, some types for you without you having to type the type annotations. So there's typing in typing, right? So that's an example for that. When you have like a, a inline function that in, in this example is defined in line. So in a local context, the compiler knows that value is a number because it's, passed as a parameter to the map function, which operates on an array of map numbers. So it infers the, the type of, of the value variable on the parameter. Whereas if you move it outside of a local context, you have to put the type explicitly because there's no global type inference. So the TypeScript does not know what the value would be if it's not directly embedded into the map function in this case. So you get something like a benefit of type inference it's not a complete one, but uh, makes life easier anyway. So my favorite thing about TypeScript is the structural typing uh, against the nominal typing uh, system. So what exactly is structural typing? It's a very peculiar feature of TypeScript, and it's one of a few languages, like few production language, few production languages that use structural typing. I think it's the most popular one that uses it. So let me give you an example. You have Java. Sorry for using Java here. I know it's not your thing, but that's the best example to show in Java. So you, imagine you have two classes, a dog and a cat, or both of them have the same fields, like the, the same internal structure, I would say. And you instantiate these two objects, one for each class, and then you, you want to find out whether the dog is an instance of cat. And it's not, obviously, because in Java, it wasn't instantiated as an instance of, of cat, but of dog instead. So that's a nominal typing. Java is a nominal type, type language, which means that if you instantiate the object of a type, that type is attached to the object, and it's like it belongs to this type, in a sense. Whereas this is structural typing here. This is TypeScript. So you have an interface. Interface is like a class definition, I would say, or a structure definition in the TypeScript. You have the same structure in both doc and cat. You have the name and the age. They, they look the same. And you can really create an object of a name doc, which would be of type cat, as you can see on the, on the left, and vice versa on the right. So what is really a cat and dog? I would say it's like a description of a structure of an object. It's not a name attached to the object. It's just a description of structure. So this is valid TypeScript, this one. So in a nominal type system, a name, a type is a name attached to a value, value being a variable or a field or something like that. Whereas in structure, in structural type system, a type is a set of all possible values. So it's a set. It's not like a name. It's not a label. It's a set. So it's like a, well, a group of values, really. 
it's a very important feature. Let me go into the details. So when you have a nominal type system, what you ask really is like, what is the type of some variable X of, of, of value X? What's the type? And it has exactly one type. The type is like say string or, or class dog or whatever else. Whereas in a structural type system, that question doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's an invalid question. The only question you can ask is the variable of type Y or, or some other type. Is, is, the, is the dog of a type dog or is the card of a type dog or is the dog of a type, type card as well? So the question is whether the value belongs to a given set of values and there'll be infinite number of sets. So it, be, it, can, it can really belong to many different sets of values. It doesn't belong to one set of value. So just a different question you, you, you can ask here. So this is really TypeScript here. I'm putting some variables here and variable A is a number. So what's a number? It's really actually, actually a set of all possible numbers. So one, two, three, four, and so on, and minus one. So like millions of numbers, all the possible numbers you can have in JavaScript. So number, like you can see here, is just a, a name or, or, or an alias given to all possible numbers, a set of all possible numbers. Whereas B is a, just a, all possible strings, right? There are billions of them, but so instead of writing down all the possible strings here, you would use the name string. How about C? Well, C, this is not a string. This is not a string type because string, a string type will be a, a set of all possible strings. And this one is not, it's just one possible string here, which is the letter A in lowercase. So the variable C can only be assigned the value of A because that's the only value allowed in this, from the set of its possible values. There's only a set of one element here. Whereas D, for example, is a set of three possible values, one, two, and three. You cannot assign any other value to D. It could be either one or two or three. So a set of three elements. What is E? Well, E is a, a set of all functions that take a number, single parameter of a, of a number type and return a string. So you can have like millions of such functions, whatever you call them, but as long as the function is a, is a function of one parameter of a number and returning a string, it belongs to a set of all such functions. And it means that it could be assigned to E. How about F? Well, F is a set of all possible values, whatever that can be created in TypeScript. So basically means like any value could be assigned to F. And that in practice really uh, disables type, type checking because if you can assign any value, well, it doesn't mean what you assign. It's like you don't have any type checking there. It's basically like disable type checking. And it's kind of useful if you want to migrate code and you start with type annotations, you usually put any because you don't know what type type annotation to put. So we put any and just serves a placeholder to for the future to put out the actual more like more constrained type, a set of a slightly smaller set of values than any. Any is like to the largest set possible. How about G? Well, G is never. That's an empty set. Well, a set can be empty. Why not? So G has cannot be assigned to any value. So what's this useful for? It's usually for like a function that throws something. So if it throws something, it doesn't return a value. So if you want to like mark a function that throws something, so it actually returns never, which is an empty set of value. Right. So because the types are set, they don't need names. You have like the hello on the, on the left, which is a type. It's not a string, it's, it's a type of one value a set of one value which which is string hello but just this one and you can give it you can give a type of name you don't have to but you can so you can use the type alias which is like type hello and give it give it a name um it's also a good good custom to use like start your own types with capital letters so hello with capital letter just a good custom typescript so on the right you can see word number one is of type hello and word number two is also of the same type. Just that 
different names of the same set of value values, which is just one hello world. And you can, as you can see, they can be assigned the same value and they can be assigned another value. So no Russian words here, no previet, just hello. Because hello is only the only one allowed. Hey, then what's the best about sets? Well, you can use algebra of sets as you probably have done in like the eighth grade of, of the primary school. I'm not sure if you remember that, but that like there was like sum of sets, intersect intersection of sets, all these like Venn diagrams. You like have these circles crossing and so on. So yeah, let's go back to school and see how it works with uh, with TypeScript. Yeah, algebra. Right, let's have some math here. Easy one though. Right, so because you can apply algebra to, to sets of value, you have something called algebraic data types or ADDs. These are really important ones, and that's what the premier feature of types is one of my favorites, really. And few of the programming languages have it, but types is one of the exceptions. So you basically have a product type and a sum type. That's one of the two basic operations on sets you can have. There are obviously more, but this one is like the most important ones in programming. And product type is really common. You can have it like in most programming language, but the sum type is pretty rare. I guess like the old versions of Java didn't have it, so you couldn't be you wouldn't be able to to use this one. Maybe the new version has it, but I'm not sure. I'm not a Java guy, so let's see what is a product type. Uh, imagine you have like two interfaces or two classes in the, in the Java programs. One is the identity, one and the other one's a contact. They have like different fields there, and you want to create a type person, which is the compound type of all of this identity and contact. So you basically, you, you create a product type, you, you join these, these two together. So uh, an object, will be a, which will be a type of person, we need to have a fields of all of these interfaces together. So you have name and age from one interface, then you have phone and email from the other one. So the object must have all of them. Otherwise, it would not be of type person. So this is a product type, it's really easy. Like in Java, you can, you can get it uh, usually through inherence. So you have a class and a subclass and the subclass adds some additional fields like to the, to the base class. So you basically instantiate the subclass and you have all the fields there. So that's really, really common. In TypeScript, it's norm, more, nor, normally like this. You, you just use the, the product type. Although you can also use inherence, but it's really less common, I guess. So what about the sum type? Okay, it's also called the tagged union. And this is like a alternative, let's say. So you have like, let's say airplane and a boat. So you define a vehicle as an airplane or a boat. You will not have whatever uses the type of vehicle, it will not be airplane and a boat like at the same time, it will be one of them, just one of them. So how would the how would the, the compiler know that you were talking about airplane and a, or a boat? Well, you need a a tag or a discriminator. It's also called a discriminator. So it's a field that's common to both types or all of the types that are part of the, the sum type. We have and they have the same name, but always a different value in each type. So I can see. So you can see here in in the airplane, the type. There's a type field, whatever name you can you can give it doesn't mean it has to be type, it could be any, any other name. And the values airplane or whatever else, but it has to be unique among the members of the of the union here. Whereas in both, you have a type, which is both. So when the compiler sees the value of this field, it knows that your the, the member element of the union is of given like type airplane on both in, in this case, instead of the other. So you can use like if else for that, checking on this discriminator or, or the tag field and be able to process the, the, uh, the object according to the specific logic. So whereas the function itself, as you can see here, takes any vehicle, but in the logic, it can discriminate them against one or, or the other. So this is like, it's really very useful type. And it's quite uncommon in, in many classic programming language, I would say in Java, maybe it has some the sum type recently, but I'm not really sure, but for a long time didn't have it. So that was pretty difficult to, to have this, to apply this uh, 
type definitions there, which is a great thing of TypeScript, by the way, because it had it from the beginning. So there's a tip for that. So you can easily like format in a different way. You can put this, this vertical bars before the values, and you could have like this the third, third example, like each type in the line, which is nicer, just visually nicer. Even many of them use this one, right? Um, because it's algebra, because it's algebra of sets, there are a few operations uh, that you can make. Um, I'll give you some examples, not all of them really, but a few select ones that we don't have time for all of them. This one's the most useful for me. So you have like a, a interface, an object definition which has many fields. Um, and you will have a partial one. Partial means that you want to create a, a type that will have some of the fields, but maybe not all of them. So you just you apply it to a partial function. That's a type level function. It's not like really programming level function. It's a type level function, partial. And you get a type which has all of the fields make marked optional, which means that you don't have to use all the fields, but you cannot use extra fields. You have to use the same fields, but you can just lift some of them out. That's partial. That's for useful one. You can use pick. Pick is for, for creating a type which will use uh, some of the fields, the one that you want, and not the others. So let's say you want to pick a name on the, of, or an age of a person and have a type that only have a name and an age. So you speak and you get that. Also omit as a like a reverse of pick. You want to exclude some some values. I mean some some fields from a from interface. Just use omit for that. And nullable and not nullable. That's really useful. Like, imagine you have a, a value and you want to make it nullable. And so you use this nullable type. And suddenly your value can be null as well. Sometimes you want it. Not nullable is the, like, the reversal of it. So sometimes you get a, a function that returns something or a null. And you want to make sure it doesn't. So obviously you need to implement that in logic, but how would you mark it as a type? Well, use this not nullable type, which removes null from, from your type. So this is like useful utility types that you can have in TypeScript. So it's all, all about set algebra. As you can see here, that's a, that's a disjoint union also with the nullable one. So it's either a, a value or a null. So let's do, let's give an example about uh, domain modeling. Let's let's model some very simple business process using uh, TypeScript, which is usually what the way you want to start building a an application. You want to model your domain. And TypeScript is really really good for that. So because of, it supports the algebraic data types, um, it's quite a fun really. Yeah, the fun is here. So let's do it. Let's have a an interface payment. So. A payment, it's like imagine like a bank or, or something like that. You have a to and from, like who pays to whom, the amount and the medium of payment, right? So what's this person to and from person, right? So a person could be a natural person or a legal person, whereas the legal person can all, can all like must be represented by a natural person. So you have a, a union type, I mean a sum, ta, sub, sum type and a product type in one type. So a person is a natural person or a um, product of natural person and a legal person where the legal person is represented by a natural person. So it sounds complicated, but it's really easy. It's like logical, really. So what's a natural person? So it's kind of like, it's a, like you and me. This is just a person. It has type N. The type is the, is the tag here. Again, you don't need to use this, the name type. It can be any other like field. But this one is just simple here. So and once the legal one also has type L and some other fields. As you can see, both of the, of the types are pretty different except for the type field. And also the legal person, he doesn't have the represented by value here, but because the legal person doesn't have it here naturally, but here in the person type, you have it like aggregated to the legal person just for the purpose of this type. Right, what's next? The payment medium. 
oh, web payment me, you can be one of the three options instead here. As you can see, cash, card, and transfer. What's cash? It has a type, some type C in this case, and some fields. What's card? Type error. All right, so, so easy to discriminate these types. And how about, oh, by the way, this is system also. As you can see, system is like, uh, can be one of the three, cannot be any string. It's you know, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, nothing else than that. And transfer has no other fields except for the type T. So that's basically this domain. Pretty easy. And you usually it grows a lot. So this is like a very simple example, but it shows you that you can model your domain using the sum and product types in an easy way and also a very flexible way. And if you start a really complicated application or even a less complicated one, and you want to model your domain, TypeScript is what, one of the best choices to do it. So model it with TypeScript and you get all the power of the algebraic data types. And so we do enjoy it. It's going to be fun, I guess. So, but that, now we like had a glance of what TypeScript is, the, the most useful features of it, the, the algebraic data types and all the peculiar peculiarities of the type system. So, but it doesn't like answer the question of why TypeScript. It's like, okay, fine, it's TypeScript is this and that, but why would you use TypeScript? Okay. So, in my experience, well, JavaScript is like pure JavaScript faster for like to write in the beginning. I would say like if you want to start like from scratch and just like quick and dirty work. Yeah, JavaScript will be faster because you don't need to think about types. You don't need to write the types, but you don't even need to think about it. Now that's fun because like, yeah, you want to do something really quick. So just write some code and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but who cares? It's just, it just has to be has to be written in a in quick way, right? But then, well, after the, the, the first period it starts to be more difficult. So you end up with some bugs that are simply there because it's JavaScript. So JavaScript will not help you with the typos, will not help you with uh, using, like trying to access something of, of undefined, um, simply because it's not, it was not designed for it. So, what, what's next? You have to fix it, retest, redeploy, and fix again, and retest again, and redeploy again, and so on. So this this loop of or of fixing and debugging all these basic errors really what's what happens next in JavaScript. Um, so what about TypeScript? Well, it requires some upfront decisions, which means that it you need to lay out your types. It's usually the, the best way to do it. So you model your domain. If you if you have one, or usually do, and so you need to define all this type structure. You need to think about functions, what types they should receive, what types they should uh, return, and so on. So use your head, and that means that that's slower because you need to think more. Okay, well, I uh, won't kill you, but obviously we slow you down. That's that's the fact. But in long long run, when you actually use your application, develop your application, you will notice that there are less bugs and the whole program, the whole process, the programming process is more scalable. You can have many people working on, on the same code and it's going to be easier this way. So you don't need to think what the other person did with your code because the types will tell you. I mean, types with well, the compiler will tell you what, ha what happened there. Um, so in the long term, long run, TypeScript is better in the sense it gives you like more stability and then uh, scalability of your code. So all in all, like JavaScript is for quick and then sloppy. Yes, it's sloppy prototyping. So do something quick, make make it work. Maybe not, but you know, fix it then. So if you if that kind of uh, that kind of application that you're working on, so yeah, so JavaScript is a good solution for that. I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, like JavaScript is also a valid language and, and has its place there. Whereas, well, TypeScript is for like high quality, long run scale software, which means that. If you're as serious about your project and the project is long run and has some quality requirements and it's made by more than one person, that really helps. Even it's like even if you have two developers on the like on the code base, it's really it pays off to have types there. So types is a better solution for that. It's just quicker this way. From my experience, uh, it gives me like about fifty percent of uh, speed up in the like. Amortized, amortized on the entire 
like life of the software product, which means that, um, yeah, it's, it's slower in the beginning, but then it pays off in the in the end. So it's about like for me, from my experience, about fifty percent faster to develop that, that kind of software. I mean, the runtime is the same, but what really matters is the development time, and that's that's faster with TypeScript. No, okay. So how to use TypeScript? Um, so we know what it is. We know why we should use it if we want to use it. So how would you, should we apply it to our projects? Well, what if you have an existing pure JavaScript project? Well, uh, if you decide to apply TypeScript, well, first you need to evaluate whether it's worth it or not. But I guess most of the time it is, even if it's like old legacy project. You could like, even applying TypeScript at once, can you, you can find some, some easily missed bugs and that happens, yeah. So apply it gradually, which means that function by function, module by module, by module or functionality by functionality. And thanks to the gradual typing of, of TypeScript, that's really easy. So put the type annotations to one function to see if it works. Okay, great. The other one, same thing. And so slowly, slowly, like function by function and like file by file, you will get a, a fully TypeScript application. However, may not be like thought out because it's like applying types afterwards. So it's better than nothing, but still. It's it's worse than if you if you started with type from scratch, obviously, right? What about an ad hoc prototype? Well, I suggest you start with type with JavaScript really, and maybe not even switch to TypeScript, but maybe yes. It depends. If you reach a certain level level of complexity, you may want to, to use TypeScript from from there on. Obviously, it will not be all at once because that's not possible. But you can gradually apply it. So same thing with, as with uh, existing JavaScript project. But yeah, if you if you have a requirement that this needs to be done like tomorrow, uh, so you probably don't want to waste time with setting up the TypeScript environment and then model domain domain modeling modeling and whatever whatnot. So start with that JavaScript, see if it works, then apply. And obviously, like all the ad hoc ad hoc projects usually end up in production and live for years and used by thousands of users. So, <laughs> so obviously there should be some time to apply TypeScript just to make sure it, it works after reaching a, like a level of complexity that requires you to work on it more profoundly than, than, than ad hoc, right? So how about the Greenfield project? Well, it, if it's like if it's gonna be a well architecture project, like thought out project, there are some projects like this. Not many of them, but there are some. Go start like start with TypeScript right away, which means model your domain, um, model your functions, define the types, define all of these. So spend some time on architecturing the thing in TypeScript, and then it's gonna be much easier to to, to actually start writing code with the types already laid out. So don't even bother with the JavaScript that way. So like, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't start with JavaScript. No, go with TypeScript right away, simply. My experience is, is like this. So when I know the project is gonna be huge, yeah, I start with TypeScript all at once. So while well, the fun begins now, see what it is. This is an example of a, a TypeScript type that I found online. It's not mine, I don't use it <laughs> like this, but this is really what a type definition could be. It's a, it's a type of alias, and you can see uh, it's pretty complicated. I don't really know what it does. It's probably some, some array. But you can find some types like this, and just don't be scared. That's not really common. Uh, but yeah, thanks. You have a thankfully, you have a compiler that uh, deals with all this stuff. So you have any questions? Uh, open to questions now so please ask anything you want go ahead yuri uh, thank you for the presentation uh so uh yes typescript uh, can simplify a lot of uh, things uh but at the same time uh it's not like one set of typescript because there is TypeScript config, and you can configure to be that uh, you just create TypeScript in your project to be either extremely painful uh, to write anything, or like you can configure yeah, yeah, it to yeah. be almost useless. 
no, look, there, there is a config file and the type compiler uses that file and you can put some configuration options like how strict you want it to be. Like if you are migrating from, from existing JavaScript base, you probably want to put some configuration options that will allow you to be some more like loose or sloppy in a sense, like allow any types or un, like lack of types, even that. So, or be a little bit like less strict with return types and so on. So if you look at the documentation, there are many configuration options for that. And some of them are designed for, for easy migration from JavaScript. So use this. And obviously it's much easier this way, but yeah, you, you can have some configuration there to, to influence that. Uh, so, and uh, one more question uh, that, do you have any specific recommendations for the TypeScript configuration? Because, you know, if you make it too strict, it's kind of painful to write anything, yeah. in, you know, implement any feature. Uh, but if you uh, in, in, if you configure it too loosely, uh, well, then there's no point of having TypeScript at all. So Yeah, yeah. I have one that I usually use, which is like allow any types because like the, the types usually require you to put type annotations when they cannot that like when it cannot infer the type so you need to put a type annotation it could be any that could be like any the word any um so it also have a has a configuration option that disables that which means that you don't have to put type annotations which which means that code looks like javascript but in fact the types are any but I want like I like to be explicit with the types and put any by myself just to be able like just for my eyes to be hurting to say of seeing this anys because when I see any I'm I'm sure it's a it's just a placeholder so I I want to put any in all of these functions and like the type annotations if I don't know the, the correct type and later when I see those any's, I want to, okay, yeah, I want to replace them. If I don't put this any's, I probably forget about it. So I would suggest this setting. I don't know what the name is of this setting, but like an explicit or implicit any of something like that. I would use this one because it's much easier to, to like then in like down the road to see if, if the type needs replacement or not. Like if I see any type, I'm pretty sure it needs to be replaced with a correct type like afterwards so i would use that any more questions yeah we have a couple of uh, questions in the chat could you please yeah, take a look oh uh, let's see chat. let's see let's see if i can chat here uh, generics yeah well generics are really easy but like i don't have time to explain them now maybe some some other presentation in the future so generics are like type functions or type level functions a generic, uh, it's also an implementation of the uh, generic polymorphism. It's actually polymorphism. So what is a type level function? It's a, it's, a, it's a function that takes a type and returns another type. So let's say if an array of, like array of numbers. So the type, like you put this array of numbers and the type return is array of numbers. Uh, so it's, can only explain a couple of words in a quick way, but once you, you once you actually see some examples, probably it's pretty easy to, to understand it. So treat them as functions, really, but functions that run in the compiler on the type level, not functions in the programming language itself. And maybe in the future, I'll just have a presentation just about generics. Why not? So maybe. What's the other one? Uh, unit Thank testing. you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Unit testing. Um, yeah, it's like in JavaScript, like pure JavaScript, you have to test whether the, the input of function is number of string. Yeah, you, you should you should do that. Whereas if you have like types to compiler and mark the mark the like the input as a string, it cannot be number because the compiler will not let you compile it. So you can skip lots of unit testing that check the basic like input output types. Because they're not necessary more. The compiler would take take care of it. So it's much easier. The unit testing with TypeScript, they focus on the logic. Like you return true or false. So make sure your function actually does the, the logic correctly. But you don't have to be like occupied with the 
notion that the function values are a string or something like that. No, the types compiler would take care of it. So just focus on the, on the on the logic, which means like much less unit tests. Any other questions?